and I'm happy that we have with us today Timothy Chan, who needs no introduction, uh, who will talk about Hopkoff's problem revisited, shaving a lock stack factor, and I cannot help giving the spoiler that this will include a two-dimensional variant of fractional cascading for a range of line, but still I find it exciting. So Timothy, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, yes, we see it. Okay. All right, so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some drawing work I did with my student, uh, David Chang, uh, which will appear in uh, the next soda. So um, I'll talk about uh, half cross problem, of course. Um, but before I get to that, um, let me begin with uh, a bit of history. Um, so in 1982, uh, Andy Yao uh, published a seminal paper uh, giving the first subquadratic algorithm for uh, the Euclidean minimum spanning tree problem in any constant dimension. Uh, and in particular in 3D, uh, his time bound was n to the nine over five. And then in 1986, uh, Bernard Chazelle um, published uh, an algorithm for another uh, basic problem, uh, line segment intersection counting, uh, where he got running time of n to the 1.695. And although for uh, both of these results, uh, they have been improved subsequently, um, I guess what makes these papers significant is that they uh, were among the first uh, subquadratic, sub, first papers to give um, uh, subquadratic results uh, in computational geometry with exponents uh, between one and two. And it opened the door for many similar uh, subquadratic results uh, for tons of other problems in our field. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, indeed, uh, many uh, papers have uh, appeared um, from the early 90s uh, all the way to uh, the present day, and uh, uh, many works by, by uh, well, uh, some works by Danny uh, and uh, many papers by Mika and, and uh, so on. Um, and the, if there's a common thread behind all these results, it's the use of range searching uh, explicitly or implicitly. For many of the most basic problems, we have a pretty good idea of what the uh, best exponent is, and we have reached um, probably close to uh, optimal uh, time bounds. Uh, but uh, there is still one rather annoying thing about this otherwise very impressive body of work, namely for all these uh, results, you see ugly extra factors of the form n to the epsilon or polylog. So then it leads to an interesting question, um, can you get rid of these extra factors? And uh, that is one of the motivations uh, behind at the talk. And to address this question, um, it makes sense to start with um, the archetype or the, the simplest problem in this class, uh, namely a uh, half problem. Uh, and the problem is simply this, given endpoints and end lines in the plane. We just want to count the number of incidence pairs. So number of point line pairs with a point line on the line. And that's it, uh, very simple. And there are different variations. Uh, you can ask for reporting all incident pairs or reporting one. Um, and at first it might sound like a, a toy problem, but, but it's really central in the sense that uh, it's a special case of many other problems. Uh, uh, for example, it's a special case of line segment intersection counting uh, because points and lines are special cases of line segments. So in order to solve the line segment intersection counting problem, you have to solve the Hofkraft problem first. And usually once Hofkraft problem is solved, then uh, the techniques uh, can be modified to solve other problems. So the problem is named after uh, John Hofcraft, uh, uh, Turing Award winner and uh, 
better known for uh, other things than computational geometry. Um, I can trace the first reference, um, but if I remember correctly, um, originally the problem was stated in uh, a different form, I think, um, uh, in, where the input is n vectors in 3D. And the goal is to determine whether there's a pair that has zero dot product. Uh, but it's not difficult to see that that version of the problem is equivalent to what I've stated here. Um, so the, the corresponding combinatorial question of uh, proving worst case bounds on the number of incident pairs uh, is uh, also very well known and well studied by combinatorial geometers, uh, which I'll say a little bit more in a later slide. Most algorithms that solve Hofkraft actually can solve uh, the following variant, uh, where instead of counting number of incident pairs, we just we want to count the number of uh, point line pairs with a point above uh, the line. And this is actually the version that I personally prefer because I hate the degeneracies and uh, this version of the problem still makes sense uh, for non-degenerate uh, input. Uh, the problem is closely related to range searching, uh, specifically half space range counting, uh, where the goal is to build data structures for a set of points so that you can quickly count the number of points um, inside any query half space. And uh, obviously, Hopcraft's problem reduces to answering n such queries on n points. Except uh, in our application, uh, we only need the offline version of the problem where you know all the queries ahead of time. OK. so. Uh, there's a trivial algorithm that solves a problem in n-squared time by just checking all pairs. As I mentioned, uh, Giselle uh, uh, in the 80s had a, uh, an algorithm with n to the 1.695 time. Uh, and if you're curious, the exponent is log base 2 of uh, the golden ratio. Uh, but it turns out uh, later, uh, there were, th there's actually simpler uh, algorithms that uh, have better exponent of uh, three halves. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the right answer turns out to be uh, n to the four thirds. And uh, the first to get close to that is uh, by Edelsbrunner, Devos, and Shereer. Uh, except there's an extra factor of n to the epsilon for an arbitrarily small constant epsilon. Uh, then uh, subsequently, uh, Agua uh, had. Uh, reduce the extra factor down to point log with something smaller than log to the 1.78. And then uh, Giselle came back with um, more powerful techniques uh, that uh, reduce the uh, exponent uh, to a nicer expression of log to the one third. But this is not the end of the story uh, because uh, Matushek, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, showed that the extra factor can be reduced to something uh, um, much smaller, something smaller than log log, uh, or uh, triple log, or log 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 log, or uh, more precisely, uh, something bounded by a constant to the power log star, where log star is the iterated log function which is extremely slow growing. It's uh, the number of times you hit the log button in your calculator to bring the number down to uh, below a constant. So uh, for n being, say, the total number of atoms in the universe, log star is still smaller than, uh, what, five. OK, so for all practical purposes, it's a constant, but not quite. So we're almost there, uh, almost uh, approaching n to the fourth thirds, but, but theoretically, not quite there yet. As to why uh, n to the four thirds is uh, believed to be the right answer, um, uh, there's this famous uh, uh, theorem by Zamoradi and Trotter, which uh, states that uh, the number of incidences, uh, the maximum number is, is uh, theta of n to the four thirds. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the lower bound was known uh, earlier with a simple construction by uh, Erdős. Uh, so then this automatically means uh, for the version of the problem where you want to report all incidences, then n to the four thirds is a, is a trivial lower bound because of the output size. Uh, but 
What about variants of the problem where, where the output size is small, like counting uh, or report one? Um, there, uh, Giselle also had an end to the forces lower bound for a version, a weighted version of the problem where uh, 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 you're working under a semi-group semi model. And Jeff Erickson also had an end to the forces lower bound uh, for the original problem, but for a restricted class of algorithms, which he called partitioning algorithms, uh, which include all the known uh, algorithms. So uh, I should say that getting unconditional lower bounds uh, in general models of computation uh, is beyond the current state of the art. So, so these results are pretty strong evidence uh, to suggest that n to the fourth thirds uh, should be the, the right bound. Um, so uh, in this talk, we'll go back to the upper bound side and give the first improvement uh, after 30 years. Uh, to matrix uh, result by completely getting rid of the extra log star uh, factor. Okay, and finally achieving end of four thirds. Okay, and in fact we present not one but two algorithms uh, to achieve this. Okay, and the second algorithm can be extended to higher dimensions as well uh, for the version of the problem for points and hyperplanes. And as I mentioned, uh, once Hopcraft is solved, usually other problems will follow. And indeed, you can uh, adapt the techniques uh, to get uh, a better algorithm for line segment intersection counting problem. Uh, again, uh, eliminating uh, the extra factors and get uh, a clean bound of n to the four thirds. And not just for intersection counting, but uh, for say computing connected components of line segments, uh, computing the closest uh, red-blue pair of points in 3D, uh, finding a Euclidean uh, minimum spanning tree for points in 3D uh, in, and in higher dimensions, uh, or uh, determining whether two polyhedral terrains intersect in 3D, and so on and so forth. I'll not attempt to list all the uh, applications. Uh, the point is we uh, removed uh, all the extra factors for a number of problems uh, as a consequence of the techniques. Uh, I will say a few more words about one particular application, uh, half space range counting uh, in 2D. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Hopcraft reduces to offline uh, half space range counting, uh, but uh, one of our solutions can be adapted uh, to also give data structures for online uh, queries. Uh, where again, we eliminate uh, all the extra factors uh, for uh, most of the trade-off curves uh, between pre-processing and query time. Okay, so um, uh, and one comment is that this though works only in 2D. So this particular result doesn't extend to higher dimensions at the moment. So in the remainder of talk, uh, I'll first uh, review the previous techniques uh, before describing the two new solutions uh, and then concluding with uh, some final remarks. All right, so let's get started. Uh, uh, we'll solve a more uh, general asymmetric uh, form of the problem where the number of points M may be different from the number of lines N. So I'll begin with a, a simple naive algorithm uh, that works well when uh, M is much larger than N. And um, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the idea is, is let's ignore the points for now and let's look at the end lines, build the arrangement of the end lines. Okay, and it has N squared vertices and so uh, order N squared faces. Uh, and now our problem is to count number of point above line pairs. So it suffices to determine the count per point. So for each point, count number of lines below it. Uh, and a simple observation is that if you have two points at the same cell, then they have the same count. Okay, so all points inside this red region will have uh, exactly three lines below it. Okay. So uh, 
then our problem uh, reduces to just determining which phase uh, each point belongs to. Because uh, as you build the arrangement, you can kind of label each phase with a uh, count. Okay, so then our problem reduces to identifying the region containing each point. Well, that's of course the point location problem, which we all know. Um, well studied uh, a problem where there are data structures uh, with log n query time uh, with linear reprocessing. So then as a result, we immediately get an algorithm with this running time because we're doing m point location queries and each query costs us log n time after an initial pre-processing of n squared time to build the arrangement. All right, so, so indeed, when m is much larger than n, uh, this is uh, efficient, very efficient. Okay, in particular, when m is bi much bigger than n squared. Okay, but in the symmetric case where m equals n, then this isn't great, it's quadratic. Um, another idea that is familiar to computational geometers is duality. Uh, this allows us to transform points to lines and lines to points in a way that preserve incidence uh, and uh, buffness. So if a point P is above line L, then in the dual, then uh, the point L star is above line P star. So then it transforms Hofcroft in, it reduces Hofcroft's problem to what? Well, to itself, but with the number of points and number of lines switched with M and N switched. Okay. So in particular, if you apply this uh, to the uh, uh, naive algorithm, we get another uh, time bound of M squared plus N log M instead. Uh, so then this time, uh, we have an algorithm that works well when n is much bigger than m. Okay. Now, to address the symmetric case, one final tool, and this is most important, uh, is uh, uh, the well known cutting lemma, uh, which allows us to do divide and conquer uh, for our lines. Okay. So uh, it states the following. Given n lines in the plane and parameter r, uh, we can cut the plane into some number of cells so that each cell intersects at most n over r lines. Okay, and cells here means um, things like triangles or trapezoids or, or, or polygons with constant complexity. Um, so for example, in 1D, you can cut the real line into r intervals, each containing n over r points. But uh, in 2D, the number of cells is not R, but it needs to be bigger. The right answer turns out to be order R squared, which is tight. And uh, the first uh, paper to uh, almost achieve this um, was uh, uh, a seminal paper by Ken Clarkson, uh, which introduced randomization techniques to computational geometry. Uh, the solution is uh, simple and powerful. Uh, it's just take a random sample of R of the lines, okay? And draw the arrangement, okay? Which has order R squared cells. And then this almost works, uh, but the technical issue is that a face in the arrangement might have many sides. So actually to make it work, you have to first triangulate each face. And then afterwards, indeed, you can prove that uh, each cell will then intersect about and over R lines, but with an extra log factor, which was later removed by Chazelle and, and Friedman by a second round of sampling. Okay, uh, and th th this requires randomization, but uh, Giselle uh, in a later paper gave an efficient deterministic algorithm that constructs uh, cutting uh, uh, in order n r time, which is uh, the best possible if you want to also um, return the list of lines intersecting each cell because then the total sizes of these conflict lists would be R squared times N over R, which is N R. So we're gonna use uh, Giselle's algorithm as black box. Okay. So then how uh, does this help? How does the cutting lemma help in solving uh, Hofgraf's problem? Where the input is not just N lines, but also N points. Well, simple. Uh, for each cell of the cutting, you just create a subproblem containing the points uh, inside the cell and the lines intersecting the cell. So we get 
R squares of problems, where each of the problem sees n over R lines. Uh, and uh, it sees m over R squared points on average, because there are m points in R squared cells. Uh, on average, but the average bound can be made worst case um, uh, simply uh, by uh, further subdividing the cells. Uh, whenever you see a, a chunk of m over r squared points, you can create a vertical cut. And, and then the number of extra cuts you need is uh, order, remains order r squared. Okay. Uh, but uh, we also need to assign the points to the cells, uh, but that's just point location. So. Uh, can be done in m log r, uh, m log n time. Uh, alternatively, uh, Chazelle's cutting construction actually uh, constructs not just one cutting, but actually a hierarchy of cutting. So it actually generates a tree structure. So you can alternatively do the point location query by uh, descending down a path of the tree. Okay, so now uh, we're going to uh, set r to be uh, n to the one thirds. And so then we'll get n to the two thirds of problems where each of the problem has n to the one thirds points and n to the two thirds lines. Okay. And the thing is then is uh, we don't need to recurse now because each of the problem is uh, in an asymmetric form where the number of lines is much bigger than the number of points quadratically many. So this can be done directly now, as we recall by the naive algorithm uh, with duality, uh, which allows us to solve each of these problems in what? Uh, n to the one third squared plus n to the two thirds log n time. So each of the problem can be solved in n to the two thirds log n. And so the total is n to the four thirds log n. So we are already very close to the desired bound, except for that pesky extra log factor, okay, which comes from uh, uh, point location. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, for the uh, uh, point above line version of the problem, you might have to do some uh, extra work uh, because you might also need to count the number of lines that are completely below each uh, cell. Uh, but that's these numbers are not difficult to compute by. Um, uh, descending down the cutting tree uh, from uh, Chazelle. Okay, and also uh, if you readjust the value of R slightly, then you can uh, lower the log n down to log to the one thirds, which was uh, Chazelle's result. Okay, but it turns out the extra factor can be reduced more dra uh, drastically uh, in, uh, as done in the subsequent paper by Matushik. And what's uh, surprising is that actually Matrix did not need any extra tools. Actually, we have all the tools we need to get the improvement. Uh, we just need to actually recurse. Okay, so so remember the recurrence is this. So uh, uh, in in matrix solution, we'll use recursion in combination with uh, duality, uh, constantly switching back between points and, and lines. Okay, so. Uh, by duality, we get a similar recurrence, uh, but with m reduced by factor of r and n reduced by factor of r squared. Okay, and if we apply these two equations in succession, then we'll be able to reduce both the number of points and number of lines by the same factor of r squared times r, i.e., r cubed. And the number of problems we need is then r to the fourth. Okay, so notice the ratio of four over three, okay, which is what we want. And so we get this recurrence. And now we set R to be as large as we can while making uh, the bound uh, bounded by n to the four thirds. So set R to be n to the one thirds over log n. And then you can see we get this recurrence where n is now reduced to polylog in a single step. So now you recurse, okay? And if you recurse, then you, you, you can get to the base case in what, how many iterations? Log star, okay, so the iterated log. Uh, so that's great. Uh, but each time we recurse, actually uh, the hidden constant behind the big O will, will go up a bit 
uh, or get amplified. Uh, and with log star iterations, the extra factor goes up to uh, something exponential in log star. And this is a precisely matrix down. Okay. So um, it seems uh, difficult to, to obtain further improvements without any, uh, unless we introduce some extra ideas because the log star comes from what? It comes from uh, iterating uh, where in each iteration there's a log, okay? And the log comes from where? Uh, it comes from point location, okay? Uh, and for point location, there's a log and lower bound. So, so it seems hard to completely get rid of this extra factor unless we incorporate some new ideas, okay? And uh, Matushik himself did try, uh, uh, but apparently, uh, uh, but uh, uh, couldn't make it work. Uh, uh, as you can see from what he wrote at the end. So, uh, so we're going to describe two new ways uh, that allows us to get rid of the extra factor. Okay. So uh, before I go on, maybe uh, now is a good time to pause and, and see if there are any questions. Uh, okay, if not, then let me unveil the new solution. Uh, the first of the two new solutions. Okay, so as uh, I said, the extra factor is because of point location. Um, and if you're doing point location in a single subdivision, uh, you cannot get do better than log n. Uh, uh, but we're doing multiple point location queries on multiple subdivisions. Uh, and the key observation is that these multiple point locations of problems are not independent. And in the sense that they, uh, the query points and the subdivisions all are generated from a common set of endpoints and uh, end lines, right? And in 1D, there is a, a famous technique that allows us to sometimes do multiple searches uh, in multiple lists uh, faster namely fractional cascading uh, proposed by Fazell and Kibos in the 80s. So many of you uh, uh, know this already, but uh, I, th I think it's worthwhile to uh, review this technique because our 2D solution will build upon this. So here's one particular setting that I'm interested in. So suppose you have a tree with a constant degree where each node stores a, a list of uh, size Z, say. Uh, and in a query, we are given a value Q, but also a subtree uh, containing the root. And the goal is to do multiple successor search, searches, uh, uh, and, uh, or more precisely, uh, do a successor search for Q in every list in a given subtree. So naively, you can do each successive search in log n uh, or log z time. Uh, so the total time is number of nodes times log z. Uh, but the claim is you can do it better and get log z plus the number of nodes. In other words, after spending an initial log z cost, uh, each node only costs you constant time. Okay. Um, and what makes this uh, non-trivial is uh, because these lists are, are could be totally unrelated. So if you happen to know, say, that the parent list always contains the child list, then this is uh, easy. You can just do uh, an initial binary search at the root, and then you can jump from uh, parent to child in constant time by following pointers, and then you're done. Uh, but the lists are not related. So that's what makes this uh, uh, a bit more uh, interesting. And the solution behind fractional cascading is uh, beautiful. Uh, it's the idea is to add extra elements to the list so that now the, the uh, lists are the parent list and the child list is related. So specifically, we're going to add a fraction of the elements in the child list uh, and add it to the parent. parent okay? So look at the child list. Uh, look at a subset 
that containing a fraction of the elements, for example, by taking one after every C elements. So this is uh, the blue uh, points uh, shown here in the picture. Add this blue subset to the pair. Okay. Now the child list and the parent list are related. Okay. And we're going to do this for all nodes in the tree uh, in a bottom up manner. So this is done actually iteratively. So not only do you uh, send a fraction to the parent, but in effect, you're sending a fraction of the fraction uh, to the grandparent and so on. And hence the word cascading in the name. Uh, but what the first thought is, uh, won't this process blow up the size of the list? Uh, no. Uh, if you look at a, a fixed node, uh, how many elements get sent to that node? Well, initially there's Z elements. And of the C0 children, each will send Z over C elements. And of the C0 squared grandchildren, each will see Z over C squared, will send Z over C squared elements and so on. So the total size at that node can be bounded by geometric series if you set the constant C sufficiently large. Okay, so space is still linearly bounded. Okay, so then how do you answer queries? Well, you start from the root and go uh, top down. At the root, you do an initial successor search. So suppose you know the answer, the successor uh, in the parent. Okay, then how do you figure out the successor in the child quickly without doing a brand new uh, binary search? Well, if you know the successor in the parent, then you can deduce the successor in the blue subset, okay, by following pointers. Now, move down to the child, okay? And then you can figure out where you are. You can find your successor in constant time because between any two blue elements, there are only C elements. Okay, so in constant time by brute force, you can figure out your successor uh, in the child list. So you can go from parent to child in constant time and then you're done. So then that's one defractional cascading. Okay, all right, but we want to do this in 2D. So uh, for our application, we want 2D point location queries rather than 1D successful search. So is there an analog for fractional to fractional cascading for uh, uh, 2D subdivisions? And the answer is, unfortunately, no, <laughs> uh, not in general. So uh, let me point out the problem here. So pro well, one issue is how do you take a subset of a subdivision? Okay, another is, uh, I, what I want is to copy that subset and then uh, overlay it with the uh, parent subdivision. But if you overlay two subdivisions, well, the size of the subdivision would blow up quadratically in the worst case, right? So at first glance, it doesn't seem to work. And in fact, Chazelle and Liu uh, formally proved a lower bound that rules out fractional cascading in general in 2D. But our observation is that fractional cascading still works for arrangements, subdivisions that are arrangements of lines, okay? which is exactly what we need in, in the application for Hopcraft. So we are fine. And the intuition is that arrangements of lines already have quadratic complexity to begin with, right? So uh, if you overlay two arrangements, well, the complexity remains the quadratic, okay, which is fine. Okay, so formally, um, uh, the setting is this. Uh, again, we have a, a constant degree tree uh, where each node now stores a list of Z lines and the corresponding arrangement uh, of size Z squared. Okay, and in a query, we're given a point Q and uh, also a subtree containing the root. And the goal is to do multiple point location queries involving the same point Q. Uh, more precisely, find uh, the face containing Q in every arrangement uh, in the subtree that's given, okay? And uh, again, uh, naively, you can do each point location query in log Z time uh, independently, but that gives us a worse bound. Uh, but the claim is I can do get this bound where in effect, after spending log Z initial cost, each node only costs us order one constant time, okay? Uh, but 
uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't, we can't really get this uh, uh, stated. Uh, I need some assumptions, okay? So uh, some caveats. So first is uh, cost is amortized. More crucially, I need to assume the queries are offline. So I need to assume all the query points are given ahead of time, okay? And at first, you might seem that this is overly restrictive. I mean, in 1D, in the offline case, you don't need fractional cascading, okay? Because you can just pre-sort all the query points if you know all of them ahead of time, and then you can replace binary search with just linear scan, scans, and effectively, that each query cost constant, amortized, okay? But in 2D, the offline version of the problem is non-trivial. And in fact, it's all that we need for Hofcraft because Hofcraft's problem itself is an offline problem. You know, all the points and lines ahead of time, right? Okay. So then how do you generalize uh, fractional cascading to 2D? Um, it's very similar, but uh, there are some uh, new extra ideas. So let me go, go through it. Okay, so the key idea is like before. We uh, take a, a fraction of the elements of the lines from the child and then pass it to the parent, okay? Uh, but the first question is, uh, now it's not clear what you mean by taking one after every C lines, okay? Once you move on to 2D. So we take a very simple approach. We take, namely we use randomization. We take a random subset, okay? So take a random subset uh, containing a fraction of the lines shown in blue here, uh, pass it to the parent like that, okay? Then as before, you can show um, uh, the size of each list uh, does not grow by much, except by a constant factor, okay? Uh, then how do you answer a query? Again, you proceed uh, top down. Uh, so suppose you have located the face containing your query points uh, in the parent arrangement. Now we can then deduce uh, the face containing the query point in the blue arrangement, right? So here we're using a, a, a simple property, a simple containment property, namely that if I take a subset of uh, the lines, then uh, the cells in the resulting arrangement will contain cells in the original, will contain, so fa a face in this arrangement will contain uh, faces in the uh, uh, original arrangement, okay? This is absolutely trivial, right? But don't underestimate this trivial property, uh, trivial containment property, because it doesn't work for other things. It works for arrangements, but it doesn't work for, say, uh, vertical decomposition or, or uh, four-node diagrams and so on, okay? So it's usually not true, but for arrangement, it's true. We do have this containment property, okay? And now let's move to the child arrangement, okay? So I, I know where I am here. Uh, but one issue is that there could still be many lines crossing this cell. Uh, and here we use a standard technique. Look at the vertical decomposition. Uh, so the vertical decomposition is defined uh, by looking at each uh, polygonal cell and then adding vertical lines to uh, chop the cell, uh, the face down to uh, vertical trapezoids. Okay. Uh, but then uh, we need to know which vertical trapezoid contains a query point. Right, so uh, naively, this will require doing a binary search in X, but that will cost you log time when the uh, face has large number of sides. Uh, so then this is where we're gonna use the offline assumption, okay? Because we know all the query points ahead of time, we can pre-sort all of them by X coordinate. Okay, then we can do all of these uh, uh, searches. So locate the vertical travel source containing all the query points by left to right scan. Okay, effectively costing constant time per point. Okay. So now we know uh, which vertical uh, travel source contains the cell, uh, contains a query. And now we're going to, at this point, apply standard analysis by Clark and Shaw that many of you are familiar with. Uh, it states uh, the following. If I take a random sample uh, of the lines and look at the vertical decomposition of the arrangement, then uh, each cell will intersect 
a small number of lines. So order C lines. So that's a constant on average, okay, in expectation. And so we can then uh, find the edge uh, immediately above the gray point by just brute force search over a constant number of things, so constant time. And once you know this edge, then you'll be able to know which phase you're in in the child arrangement. And then that's it. Okay, so you can go from parent to child in constant expected time. And that completes the solution to 2D fractional cascading. Okay, so uh, any questions at this point? Okay, so then uh, how do you apply this to, to solve half crafts problem? Um, so um, remember, we had this recurrence from the cutting lemma. And remember, we set R to be one third, n to the one thirds. So we have n to the two thirds of problems, each involving n to the one thirds points and n to the two thirds lines. Okay, and remember we applied duality uh, before we switch to the naive uh, algorithm. Okay, so now we have each sub problem containing into one third lines and into two thirds points. And the original solution was build the arrangement of uh, the lines and then do point location for each of these points. Okay, and as a result, we get into the forces times log n. We're going to speed things up by doing the point location queries more efficiently using the technique I've just described, okay? Uh, but before we can apply our technique, we need a tree, okay? So where's the tree? Uh, and the lucky thing is we have a tree. Uh, when we construct the cutting with Chazelle's method, his method actually builds a hierarchy of cutting, okay? And that gives you uh, a constant degree tree. Okay, we don't need to do point location queries on the internal nodes of this tree, so we might uh, set the list uh, to empty there. And when we apply fractional cascading, these lists will be populated with uh, elements from the descendants. Okay. All right, and uh, if you look at a query point, uh, where would it appear? So a query point corresponds to a line back in primal space. And uh, the nodes that the query point participate in corresponds to the cells in the hierarchical cutting that are, are crossed by that primal line. And the thing is with hierarchical cuttings is that a uh, parent cell contains the child cell. So then the, the uh, list of nodes that a query point participate in will then be a connected subtree. And so our technique is applicable, okay? And then immediately uh, we got rid of the log n and get the desired bound n to the four thirds, okay? Without recursion, okay, so. So then that's the first solution. Okay, so any questions before we get to the next solution? Okay, so. We now will present uh, a completely different solution, okay? So uh, the previous one uh, uses randomization. So this one will be deterministic. But uh, this new one will require some um, out of the box kind of thinking, okay? So it will produce very unusual algorithms. That will be, uh, so warning, totally impractical, okay? But uh, the ideas are, um, are quite, powerful in general and, and uh, directly uh, quite interesting. Okay. So it's based on a meta approach. Uh, and no, I'm not <laughs> referring to Facebook here. Um, so uh, the observation is this. So uh, suppose there's an efficient decision tree to solve half cross problem uh, using n to the fourth thirds comparison. So in the decision tree setting, we're only interested in uh, bounding the number of comparisons involving the input real numbers and totally ignore all other costs. Okay, and if there's an efficient decision tree, then the claim is it can be converted automatically to an efficient algorithm running in n to the fourth third time. Okay. And this observation is actually not new. Uh, it has been pointed out even in uh, Matushik's original paper. Okay, and the proof 
is simple. So let me uh, quickly uh, uh, re-describe it. Um, so with matrix recursion, remember we can in a single step go from n to polylog. So if you apply the recursion uh, matrix recursion three times, say, then the input size n gets reduced to something like triple log. Uh, and when the input size is this small, you can afford to exhaustively uh, by brute force, build the decision tree, uh, the complete decision tree. Okay, and if for small size of problems you can solve the problem in s to the fourth time, then by this equation you'll be able to solve problems of size n also in n to the fourth time for large n. Okay, and a proof. Okay, and this type of trick is not. Uh, new and it's uh, been used for uh, other problems as well, uh, like uh, APSP, all pair shorts pass, three sum, uh, minimum span tree, and so on. Okay, so then with this observation, uh, it suffices to study the problem in the decision tree model. Okay, but is it any easier to shave logs in the decision tree setting? And the answer is yes, okay. So there's a, a wonderful illustration of this phenomenon that it's easier to shave logs uh, for decision trees uh, in a classic uh, paper by Fredman in the 70s, okay. And in uh, Fredman's paper, he looked at uh, the classical problem of sorting. So uh, his result is that sometimes you can sort K numbers using just linear number of comparisons in the decision tree setting rather than k log k. Uh, sometimes when the numbers are derived from a smaller set of n real numbers. Okay, uh, this is a bit informal. So let me uh, be more concrete uh, with a specific example. Say you have n lines in the plane and you want to sort all the x coordinates of all the intersection points, all n squared intersection points. So sort all the uh, vertices of the arrangement. Okay, so normally that requires n squared log n time, but in the decision tree setting, you can solve the problem in n squared comparisons according to Fredman's result. And that's because the n squared values actually all are derived from just order n uh, input numbers, namely the slopes and intercepts of the input lines. Okay. Uh, and another application is the x plus y sorting problem, but that one turns out to have an even better decision tree. Um, uh, um, and I'll, I'll now go to give um, a reinterpretation of Fremen's technique. Um, and the key is this. We're going to think of the input as a point in high dimensional space. Okay, so because the input consists of n real numbers, it can be viewed as a point in high dimensional space. And this is uh, already a bit. Um, outside the box is a bit abstract, uh, but it's actually a common idea, uh, especially in lower bound proofs uh, for algebraic decision trees. But we're gonna turn things around and use this idea for upper bounds. Okay, so a comparison uh, can be viewed as uh, testing membership in some semi-algebraic set of uh, low degree. So for example, for our problem of sorting uh, uh, vertices in arrangement, uh, sorting intersection points, uh, there, a uh, comparison is um, deciding whether the x-coordinate of the intersection of two lines is smaller than the uh, x-coordinate of the intersection of another pair of lines. Okay, so then that reduces your low-degree predicate. Okay, and uh, we're going to assume that the number of number of possible comparisons you can make is polynomially bounded. So for our example, uh, there are only n to the four different comparisons you could possibly make because a comparison is defined by four lines. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is pre-compute the arrangement uh, of all these sets. Okay, this is living in high dimensional space, so it's computationally very expensive. But I don't care because it costs us nothing in the decision tree setting because we haven't even looked at the actual input. <laughs> okay, um, so then cells in this arrangement corresponds to a sign, essentially a sign vector. Okay, where the i component is plus one or minus one depending on whether uh, the cell is inside or outside the i set. 
So naively, the number of cells is then bounded by the number of sign vectors, which is two to the number of sets, which is two to the n to the c. But uh, by the well-known um, Milnor theorem, the number of cells is actually smaller. It's bounded by what? It's it's uh, number of sets raised to the power the dimension, right? So then that's n to the order n, okay? Which is a better bound. And this is crucial. Okay, so now I'm gonna make a definition. Um, I'm gonna call a cell active if uh, it is consistent with the outcomes of the comparisons made so far by the algorithm. Okay, so in other words, uh, the comparison outcomes uh, a match with uh, the corresponding components of the sign vector for the uh, associated with the cell. Okay, so as the algorithm runs, uh, you're going to make more and more comparisons. So cells will, will uh, a number of active cells will go down. Okay, so initially everything is active. At the end, uh, it will get much smaller. Uh, I'm going to define the potential to be the log of the number of active cells. Okay. So by Miller's theorem, uh, the potential is always bound by n log n. And as I said, number of active cells can only go down. So the potential can only decrease as the algorithm runs. Okay. So let's see this framework in action for the sorting problem from Fredman. So if you want to sort k numbers, uh, by insertion sort, it reduces to k insertions. And each insertion essentially uh, corresponds to just doing a successive search in a prefix that's already sorted. Okay, so it suffices to describe how to do successive search. Naively, that requires log n time by binary search. But what Fredman proposed is a weighted binary search. Okay, so what we'll do is compute weighted median satisfying the condition shown here. Okay, so essentially we're using weighted medians where the weight corresponds to the number of active cells. Okay, so that's a huge number. So computationally expensive to enumerate all the active cells, but, but it costs us nothing because uh, we ha haven't made any actual comparisons yet. Okay. So once we identify the weighted median, we're going to actually make a comparison. Okay, so compare Q with AM and AM plus one. If Q happens to be in between, then we're done. We have found the successor. Otherwise, after you make the comparisons, the number of active cells will go down. It will get halved. Okay. And so that means the potential, which is log of the number of active cells, will decrease by one at least. So the, what this means is that we can charge the work, the comparison we have just made to decrease in potential. So that effectively, we can find the successor in constant amortized time. So time is constant plus the decrease in the potential. Now we're doing k insertions, a k successor search to sort k numbers. So then the total cost is order k plus total decrease in potential. And uh, as I've said, total decrease in potential is bounded by n log n. And so indeed, when the number of elements you're sorting is much bigger than n, sorting actually costs you linear number of comparisons. Okay, so amazingly cool technique. So the idea is replace binary search with weighted binary search with giant weights, okay, that are dependent on the number of active cells. Okay, so um, now sorting is essentially a 1D problem. Our new observation is that actually Fredman's technique is much more general than that. It extends far beyond 1D sorting and 1D searching. In fact, in the way I've described it, it's actually pretty straightforward now to extend uh, the technique to 2D point location. All you have to do is just replace weighted medians with weighted centroid in uh, the tree that is used to do point location. Okay. And then everything generalizes. Okay, so in fact, in the paper, we formulate a, a general framework uh, and uh, it's much more general than even fractional cascading. 
and works for all kinds of problems, okay? Uh, um, uh, uh, like 2D comic solves and so on, okay? So, um, and higher dimensional point location. So uh, the point is, uh, uh, the only catch is that it, it all, this kind of log shaping only works in the decision tree setting. Okay, and now the application to Hopcraft is immediate. Uh, remember with the cutting lemma, we reduced to answer the four search point location queries, but now in this model, each query co has constant amortized cost. So the total time is bounded by n to the four thirds plus the total decrease in potential. And the total decrease in potential is n log n. The first term dominates. We're done. <laughs> okay. So the moral, the lesson in all this is um, a hot crash problem. For hot crash problem, it suffices to look at decision tree complexity. And for decision tree complexity, it's actually fairly easy to shape log factors if the log comes from something like binary search or point location, okay. So uh, close to running out of time. So now I'm going to conclude uh, with uh, some final remarks. Um, uh, the second solution based on decision trees extend, it's very general, so extends naturally to D dimensions, but not the first solution because the first solution relies on this vertical decomposition trick, which uh, does not work now when you get to 3D for example, okay. On the other hand, the first solution based on fractional cascading uh, can be modified to give you a data structure for uh, online queries, half space range counting queries in 2D. Uh, but the uh, decision tree approach does not uh, work because of that potential uh, argument, um, uh, the amortization argument involving that potential function. Uh, so then that leads to a, 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 a a natural open question, then can you also get data structures, similar data structures for 3D? Um, now that solution one doesn't work, okay? Um, uh, and uh, finally, um, shave more logs uh, for, for, for um, other problems. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the end. So thank you for listening. Thank you very uh, any much, questions? Uh, and we can now uh, take questions. Anybody with questions? Uh, let me start with a question, uh, yes. Timothy. Uh, can you explain, we, we have vertical decomposition in three dimensions. And if you have a full arrangement, then you still have, a, a, if it's a planes, then it's still only complexity and cubed. What, what, what's, mm -hmm. the, what's the problem in, in extending the idea from vertical decomposition in 2D to 3D? Okay, so we can pre-sort all the x-coordinates. That's what we did for the 2D case to determine what, uh, which cell in the vertical decomposition containing query point. But pre-sorting by x alone <laughs> will not help you determine which cell in the vertical decomposition contains a query point, even if you know the identity of the face you're in, right? Sure, but you have this trick where it's like saying that because we know uh, how to do uh, fractional cascading in 1D, it, we cannot extend it to 2D, perhaps. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but just I, I don't <laughs> immediately see how, okay? So, so in, in 2D, you project down to, to 1D, okay? And essentially it's a linear, you can do all the loca uh, location queries by linear scan. Uh, I don't know how to generalize that uh, in the 3D set, a case. Uh, so when you project, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated structure. And uh, what kind of pre-sorting allows you to then do, do the 2D location queries in, in constant time each? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it sounds more complicated. It might be doable with some extra ideas, maybe. Uh, but. But I, I, I don't immediately see how. So that's <laughs> very intriguing possibility to consider. Yeah. So, yeah. And I really want 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 to uh, want that to work. Okay. Because I want also data structures for, for three D and higher. And currently, I can only get data structures using the fractional cascading idea, not the decision tree idea. So. Okay. Okay. Questions. 
don't be... Um, yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Micha. Uh, can you say a few more words about how do you turn the upper bound in decision tree to an actual algorithm? I may have missed something or you didn't say much. Okay, so uh, it's uh, based on matrix recursion because in one step, I can reduce n to point log. So if I do this a constant number of times, I can reduce n to say triple log. So if I can uh, get uh, s to the four thirds for input of size s that is small, then applying this formula gives us n to the four thirds. So once you have the full decision tree for small search, input sizes. Searching, it, searching in it is the same as the number of comparisons that you are making. There are no hidden, no extra hidden fact, uh, uh, terms or something. Uh, uh, I have ignored details about actually the construction of the decision tree itself, but the intuition is that when the input size is small enough, then you can actually afford to uh, build the, the entire tree. Okay, and the tree will have height uh, as for four thirds. So the number of nodes in the decision tree is uh, two to the S to the four thirds. Okay. Yes, but, the, the, but once you've constructed it, searching in it now is just, there are no it's extra down hidden, a path. There are no extra hidden factors, just comparisons. Yes. yes. Okay. And in fact, decision tree is just one way to look at it. You can imagine actually just looking at Fredman's uh, so um, method and essentially all the operations that I call expensive because the number of active cells is too large, you can use table lookup uh, to, to implement each step of, of, of the solution uh, uh, directly. Okay, so, so decision tree is one way to look at it, but uh, alternatively you can think of uh, the case when N is very small then building the N dimensional arrangement, for example, will be cheap when N is very small. Okay, so you can directly translate each step of the, the method um, as well. 